Okay, this may be a good time to start, I think. Let's see. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, okay, so as I mentioned yesterday, today we have uh, presentations on uh, some recent research that's related to what we've been talking about. And the first uh, lecture will be given by Minesh Patel. Minesh is my PhD student here at ETH. And he's going to talk about beer, bit exact, ECC recovery. He's been working on error mechanisms and understanding uh, the internal error correcting code mechanisms inside DRAM chips, which is a fascinating topic. And he recently presented this work uh, at Micro last week. And uh, this work got the best paper award at the conference. So I guess Minesh is not uh, a stranger to best paper awards because his paper at DSN, Dependable Systems and Network Conference, in 2019 was also awarded uh, the best paper award. So Minesh will talk about it, and uh, there, there are a lot of interesting research directions building on it. So maybe he'll spend a couple of minutes on that also. Minesh, take it away. Are you there? Yes, sorry. I'm okay, great. struggling to hit the unmute button. Zoom okay. It. Sure. Um, but yeah, no, thank you. Um, okay. so. As uh, Professor Mutlu said, today I'm going to talk about um, our recent work, um, BitExact ECC Recovery or BEER. And so here I have sort of an extended version of the conference talk that we gave, which contains a little more detail on different aspects of the work. And hopefully you guys will you know, find this interesting. So um, just before I jump into the actual material of our work, I want to cover a couple of slides of background on error correcting codes, just as a refresher for you guys in case, you know, you haven't seen it in a while or you're unfamiliar with the material. So um, first, yeah, I'm gonna talk a little bit about error correcting codes. And so in general, the key idea of error correcting codes is to add metadata to the data that you're loading and storing from memory in order to allow the memory controller to reconstruct corrupted data whenever an error occurs. And in this case, an error could just be a simple bit flip. And so if we have a typical system that looks something like this, where we have a CPU core and a DRAM controller, which typically lie within the same die so you can think of this as you know, within an SOC or within the CPU package. And then we have DRAM, which typically lies off chip. Whenever the CPU core wants to do a load or store operation, it first goes through this error correcting logic within the memory controller before going to DRAM. So for example, let's take a look at the store data path. So when the CPU core wants to store a piece of data, in this example, let's say it's a four bit vector of D0 through D3, this data first goes through the ECC encoder inside the DRAM controller. And this encoder adds additional bits to the data bits. And we call this metadata or parity check bits. And essentially this metadata allows the, the ECC logic to figure out what happens when an error occurs. And so in this situation, the DRAM actually stores this expanded representation of the data, including all seven of these bits. And so now when the CPU core decides to do a load operation, it loads, uh, it issues a load and the memory controller goes ahead and reads all seven of these bits from the DRAM. And for sake of example here, let's say we have a single bit error. And so here we show that bit D3 um, actually has a bit flip. And so when this makes its way to the DRAM controller, the ECC decoder will look at this and try and reconstruct the true value of D3 based on this additional metadata that's appended to the regular data. And so in this case, it's a single bit error. And let's say this is a single error, single error correcting code. And so the DRAM controller is able to reconstruct the bit D3 and sends the correct data back to the CPU core. And so this, in essence, is the function of error correcting codes. And so typically, when we have more metadata, so in this example, we just had four data bits and three parity check bits, but we could have more parity check bits for the same amount of data bits. And so having more metadata or potentially fancier logic within the ECC encoder and decoder would allow us to correct even more errors. And so we're not going to talk too much about what's happening inside the ECC encoding and decoding logic just yet, but I'll talk about it as we need it later in this talk. And so we typically have three types of DRM systems that may or may not use ECC. So the first type, um, the first type here uses no ECC. And this, we simply have the CPU and the DRM that talk to each other without any ECC logic in the way. The second type of system uses what we call rank level ECC. And this is essentially very similar to the picture that I just showed on the previous slide. And here the ECC logic is contained within the CPU itself. So when the CPU issues requests to the DRAM, we actually have an extra large DRAM that can store both the data that the CPU is writing and the parity check, data, parity check bits that the CPU generates. And the third type of system is what's called ONDA ECC. And here the ECC logic is contained within the DRAM chip. So from the perspective of the CPU, this is exactly the same as the no ECC system, 
where the CPU is just reading and writing data from the DRAM. And instead, the DRAM internally is generating its own parity check bits and storing them within the DRAM itself. And the CPU is essentially unaware that any of this is happening. And so in our work, we're focusing primarily on this case of Onda ECC. And so I'll talk about this extensively. OK, so th that concludes sort of my background in ECC. And if there are any questions, go ahead and post them on the Zoom chat. I'll, I'll try and keep an eye on that as I'm going through this talk and, uh, and answer the questions that you might have. OK, so in order to introduce our work, I'm going to first start out with a high level summary of this talk. And so the problem that we tackle in this work is that DRAM on the ECC complicates third party reliability studies. And this is because the on the ECC implementation is typically highly proprietary. And this proprietary design obfuscates the raw bit errors that occur within the DRAM chip in an unpredictable way from the perspective of the third parties. And unfortunately, this interferes with any sort of design, test and validation, or characterization studies that these third parties might want to do. And so to overcome this problem, our goal in this work is to understand exactly how Onda ECC obfuscates these errors. And to this end, we make two contributions in our work. The first contribution is what we call BEER, which is a new testing methodology that determines a DRAM chip's unique Onda ECC function. In other words, its parity check matrix. And this actually represents the mathematics that's going on within the ECC encoder and decoder. And we'll talk about this a lot later. Now, Beer does this by exploiting ECC function specific behavior that's revealed in uncorrectable error patterns. And in doing so, Beer requires no hardware support, inside knowledge, or metadata access, which makes Beer applicable to a commodity DRAM chips on the market. Our second contribution is Beep, which is a new error profiling methodology that infers the raw bit error locations of error prone cells using just the observable uncorrectable errors. Now, in our work, we evaluate Beer in two different ways. First, we've given experimental demonstration by applying beer to 80 real LPDDR4 DRAM chips from three major DRAM manufacturers. And then to complement our experimental studies, we show beer's correctness in simulation for over 100,000 representative on the ECC codes of various ECC word lengths. And finally, we hope that both beer and beep enable many valuable studies going forward based on our research here. Okay. So here's a quick outline of my talk. And the first thing I'm going to give, talk about is um, I'm going to talk about some of the challenges that are caused by an unknown on the ECC mechanism. So let's talk about how some third party DRAM users might make use of commodity DRAM chips. So the first category we have are system architects who design all sorts of system level, um, system level mechanisms, including uh, error mitigation mechanisms that need to interact with the DRAM chips that the system uses. The second type of user we deal with are test engineers who perform extensive third-party testing and validation of DRAM chips. And finally, we have research scientists who perform error characterization studies in an attempt to understand how the DRAM chips work and what their error characteristics look like. And so through the course of their work, all three of these third-party users need to understand a DRAM chip's reliability characteristics. And this includes looking at things like variation between different chips, the temperature dependence of these reliability characteristics, the locations of weak cells within the DRAM chip and so forth as listed on the slide. And so the question we want to ask at this point is how do these third party users actually study DRAM reliability characteristics? And the answer here is testing and error characterization studies. So now let's take a look at these three types of DRAM based systems that I talked about at the beginning. So the first type of system uses no ECC at all. And so here we have a testing, a testing device, which we're going to call tester. It could be a CPU or FPGA or you know, what have you, as long as it's able to interface with the DRAM chip. And here there's no ECC in the way. And so when the tester is studying this DRAM chip, whenever it writes data, for example, here, this four bit data pattern, this data is exactly what gets stored into the DRAM storage. And it's exactly what's read out by the tester on a read operation. The second type of system that we considered used rank level ECC, where the ECC logic is contained within the tester. And so here, the, the situation is pretty much the same as an OECC case, except in this case, the tester is actually writing the expanded representation of the data to the DRAM chip. But in the same way, the same data that's written is the same data that's stored and is also the same data that's read out. And now the third case is with Onda ECC, where the ECC logic is within the DRAM itself. And here the situation is a little bit different. So here the tester writes this four bit data pattern, but upon entering the DRAM chip, it goes through an unknown ECC encoding function. And this means that the expanded representation of the data is generated within the DRAM chip and then stored into the DRAM storage. Now, when the tester performs a read operation, it first goes, the, the, the read data, which is the expanded representation, goes through the ECC decoder, which is unknown to the tester. And then the four bit data is returned to the tester. Now, let's take a look at what happens when errors occur. So in the first case with no ECC, let's say that a two bit error occurs in bits D0 and D2. 
Now, this is relatively straightforward from the tester's perspective, because when it does a read, it effectively gets the exact data that's stored in the DRAM storage. And so the tester knows exactly what happened within the DRAM storage. And so effectively, it knows that there's errors in bits D0 and D2. The case is very similar for rank level ECC. Now, when two bit errors occur in bits D2 and P1 in this case, the tester knows exactly what happened because it's able to read these bits out. And so it knows exactly where the errors are. And in these two cases with no ECC and rank level ECC, things are relatively straightforward because these error patterns that are observed by the tester depend only on the position of the errors within the DRAM storage itself. Now, unfortunately, the situation is quite different with ONDA ECC. And here, when errors occur within the DRAM storage, the read data that the tester sees actually depends on what's going on with both the errors inside the DRAM chip and the ECC decoding function, which is unknown to the tester. And this means that the errors that the tester observes depend on both the errors positions themselves and on the ECC logic, which is unknown. And this causes problems because now the tester doesn't really know what's going on within the DRAM chip. So let's take a look at what a typical DRAM on the ECC design looks like. And so manufacturers today use a 128-bit single error correcting Hamming code. And so this is a type of ECC code, which is similar to what I showed in the previous slide, except it operates on 128-bit data and it has eight parity check bits, and it's able to correct a single bit of error within this 128 plus eight bit code word. Now here's what this looks like in the context of a DRAM chip. And we see that there's an external DRAM bus that interfaces with chip IO within the DRAM chip, and there's ECC logic before this data actually makes its way to the data store. Now the ECC encoder and decoder represent the ECC logic, and they're both fully contained within the DRAM chip. And this means that they are invisible outside of the DRAM chip. Now, what I want to point out here is that there are many ways to implement this 128-bit Hamming code. And these correspond to using different ECC functions, which are known as parity check matrices or H matrices. So all of these, uh, the important thing to keep in mind here is that all of these different implementations essentially correct one error, but they act differently when faced with two or more errors. And this difference is in the way that the parity check matrix is designed. And so I'm going to talk about this in the next few slides. Now, manufacturers are free to choose any design that they want. So any of any parity check matrix, essentially. And they might do this based on different circuit optimization goals, such as optimizing for chip area or power consumption. And the details of their particular choice are highly proprietary, even when using non-disclosure agreements with the manufacturers. So now let's quickly take a look at the effect of using these different on ECC implementations. So in this experiment that I'm about to present, we simulate uniform random errors within a 32-bit ECC word. So this figure shows the results of this analysis. So on the x-axis here, we show the bit index into this 32-bit ECC word. And so this ranges from 0 to 31. And the y-axis shows the relative probability of observing an error in each of the x-axis bit positions. Now, because we're simulating uniform random errors, we essentially see a flat line here, which means that the probability of error is roughly even for each of the different bit positions. And so this is what we observe within the actual DRAM chip itself. Right? It's the pre-correction error distribution. Now, when we go ahead and simulate three, a three different 32-bit single error correction Hamming codes with three different parity check matrices, we see that the post-correction relative error probabilities look quite different from this uniform random error that we started with. And this is because these different parity check matrices act, different, act in different ways on different bit positions. And we end up with highly non-uniform errors across all of these different bit positions. And so essentially, the same error characteristics that we have before correction can appear very differently with different ECC functions. And so the post-correction error characteristics are no longer obvious just based on how the pre-correction error characteristics look. And so this introduces significant challenges for third parties that are testing these DRAM chips. And so let's go back to those three different third parties that we talked about before. The first party was system architects who design error mitigation mechanisms that need to work with the DRAM chips. And so ONDA ECC forces these system architects to try and support unpredictable chip-dependent memory reliability characteristics. The second group were test and validation engineers who perform post-manufacturing testing. In this case, ONDA ECC hides the root causes of uncorrectable errors. And this is really important because these test and validation engineers want to know exactly why they're observing errors after manufacturing. And second, ONDA ECC defeats test patterns that they use to target physical cells because the ECC encoder obfuscates the data before it's written to the actual device. And so we don't necessarily know, just based on the data that we're writing to the chip, what's actually stored within the chip. And the third group are research scientists conducting error characterization studies. And here, ONDA ECC conflates the raw bit errors that we're trying to study with ECC artifacts. And this effectively obfuscates the true physical cell characteristics that are the target of our study. Now, these challenges all arise from the inability to predict how ECC transforms error patterns. 
So to overcome these challenges, our goal in this work is to determine the ONDA ECC function without any hardware support or tools, prior knowledge about ONDA ECC or access to ECC metadata. For example, the internal uh, mathematics that the ECC function uses and the error syndromes that it generates and, and so forth. And so in the context of a real DRM chip, this means that we want to know exactly what's happening inside the encoder and decoder, because this would reveal exactly how ONDA ECC is scrambling errors and would allow us to infer the raw bit error locations behind the ECC mechanism. And in order to achieve these, we introduced these two contributions, BEER and BEEP. And I'm gonna talk about both of these um, in the next, in the next uh, segment of my talk. Okay. So now I'm gonna talk about BEER, which determines the ONDA ECC function. So here I'm showing a picture again of our typical ONDA ECC function that we've been looking at before. So we're gonna take a little closer look at the encoder and decoder. So one important thing to note is that both the encoder and decoder in this type of ECC code use linear operations. And so what this means is that we can think of the encoder as a black box that takes in a data word, um, which is the data that the CPU wants to write to the memory device and outputs the code word, which is the expanded representation that's actually written into the DRAM storage. Now we can think of this as a black box, but what's going on inside here is actually a linear transformation. And therefore we can think of it as a matrix multiplication where the data word is multiplied with a matrix that's conventionally called the generator matrix or G which essentially defines the transformation from the data word D to the code word C, right? And so it's this linear transformation that we want to figure out. Similarly, the decoder is also a linear, uh, linear transformation. And here it inputs the code word prime, which is how we refer to a code word that might potentially contain bit flips and outputs the data word prime, which is the data word after correction, right? And so if uncorrectable errors occurred, potentially the data word prime also contains errors. But if there were no uncorrectable errors, then the data word prime might be exactly what was originally written to the DRAM chip. And so here the decoder uses, again, a matrix multiplication. And we can think of this as a parity check matrix, which is typically called the H matrix acting upon the code word prime. And so together, this G and H matrices define the ECC function. And they're exactly what we want to figure out in our work. So let's take a look at how the decoding process works in a little more detail. So the decoding process typically uses two steps and is generally called syndrome decoding. The first step involves calculating an error syndrome that points to exactly where the bit errors are within the code word. And the second step is to go ahead and correct the errors if any are detected. And the second step is, is trivial. It essentially just involves flipping the bit to what it should actually be. So in the case of correctable errors, here we show computing the error syndrome S by using the parity check matrix H to act upon the code word prime, which potentially contains errors. And here we're depicting a single error correcting code. And so we show that a correctable error is a single bit error within the code word prime. And we see it highlighted as this red dot here. And so when we evaluate this matrix multiplication and compute the error syndrome S, S will actually point to the location of the error. And here, since we had a single bit error, it will point exactly to where the error is. Now the situation is quite different for uncorrectable errors. And so here we show the exact same scenario of computing the error syndrome except we show three bits of error. And because we're supposing this is a single error correcting code, this error correcting code cannot correct all three of these errors. And so the syndrome that's computed points to an arbitrary location within the code word prime, which depends on the particular parity check matrix used. So uh, to restate that, essentially it points to an H dependent position within the code word. Right? And so this is the key idea of beer. And it's to exploit the H dependence of uncorrectable errors to try and disambiguate different ECC functions. So let's take a look at how we put this together into an actual you know, methodology. So the approach that Beer uses is to iteratively isolate each of the linear components of the H matrix. And this approach was demonstrated by prior work in 2019 for rank level ECC. And so let's take a look at how this approach, um, you know, let's illustrate this approach essentially. So supposing that we start with a code word of all zeros, we first inject errors in bit position zero. And so we see that code word prime has a single bit error represented by the one shown at the bit zero position. Now, when we go ahead and compute the error syndrome, we see that all the entries in the H matrix are zeros. And so essentially the code word prime has isolated the first column of the H matrix. And indeed the error syndrome S is exactly equal to the first column of the parity check matrix. And so essentially we've isolated that component of the H transform. So we can go ahead and repeat this procedure by injecting errors in each of the different bit positions and systematically extract every single column of the H matrix. And after going through each of the different bit positions, we've essentially extracted the entire H matrix. Now, this is the case for rank level ECC. Unfortunately, ONDA ECC introduces two challenges that make this approach difficult. First, we have no way to inject errors in a particular bit position, 
because the the code word and the metadata and everything are stored entirely within the DRAM chip and we don't have direct access to them. And the second challenge is that we have no way to observe error syndromes. So with the case with rank level ECC, the memory controller often exposes these error syndromes and you can simply read them from the CPU. However, with on ECC, these error syndromes are not observable because they're all self-contained within the DRAM chip. And so let's see how we tackle these two challenges in our work. So the first challenge is to inject errors in different bit positions. And so our key idea for overcoming this challenge is to deliberately induce data retention errors. So data retention errors are actually relatively easy to induce. So let's assume that we're interfacing with our DRAM chip using a CPU or FPGA, and we can induce data retention errors simply by pausing normal DRAM refresh operations. And so this figure on the right sort of illustrates what this looks like from the perspective of a single DRAM cell. So the x-axis here shows time, and the y-axis shows a voltage of the DRAM cell. And so in the blue curve, we illustrate a cell that starts out initially charged. Now, as time goes on, the charge depletes from the cell just due to you know, background leakage mechanisms within the DRAM chip. And periodic refresh operations restore this charge so that the DRAM cell restores to its fully um, it, its high voltage value, essentially. And this prevents charge loss. However, once we pause DRAM refresh and no longer have these refresh operations going, the voltage degrades below the safe voltage threshold, and we can no longer initially we can no longer tell which data was initially stored in the cell. And this essentially represents data corruption, and we call this a data retention error. Now, in contrast to this initially charged cell, if we look at the initially discharged cell, which is shown by the orange curve, we see that it always stays in the discharge state and essentially never experiences a data retention error. So in our work, we exploit this difference between the charged and discharged cells because this allows us to restrict errors to specific bit positions. So let's take a look at what this looks like in an actual test pattern. So here, the test pattern we show is a four-bit test pattern where only a single bit is set to the charged state. And we represent this with the yellow cell shown in yellow. Um, yeah, the yellow cell that's programmed to a one, and the other bits are assumed to be discharged, shown as zero. So after ECC encoding, the data looks like this. The first four bits effectively reflect the test pattern that we use, and there are three additional peri check bits whose values we do not know. Now, note that here we're assuming that the data itself is stored unmodified, and this is what's referred to as a systematic encoding. And it's actually very reasonable for memory devices because it allows a lot of really nice optimizations. So you can imagine that in the common case where we don't have errors in the encoded data, we can directly just read out these cells without having to go through additional logic and burn extra power or anything like this. Um, so it's a very reasonable assumption. Now, in this encoded data, what, what's important to note here is that the possible data retention errors that occur are limited to specific bit positions. And this includes the charge bit that we initially programmed to the charge state and any of the parity check bits that might be in the charge state. Because we don't necessarily know their values, we have to assume that any of them could be charged. And, and so in this way, we're able to inject errors in specific bit positions. So the second challenge that we want to deal with is to infer error syndromes. And because we cannot directly see them, we need to find a way to observe some effect of computing different error syndromes within the DRAM chip. And so I'm going to illustrate an example here of how we do that. So assuming we start out with the same test pattern as in the previous slide, um, here I've replaced the ones and zeros with C and D to represent charged and discharged. Now let's suppose for sake of this example, after ECC encoding, the parity check bits look like as shown on the slide, where two of them are in the discharge state and one of them is in the charge state. Now, when we go ahead and induce data retention errors, there are several possible error patterns that might occur. The first is the case of no error at all, where both of these charged cells stayed in the charge state. And here there's no errors that we observe. The second case is the case of, un of correctable errors, where one of the two charge bits flips to the discharge state. Now, no matter which one flips to the discharge state, as long as there's a single error, the single error correcting code will be able to correct this error, and we won't observe any effects outside of the DRAM chip. Finally, the third case that can occur is the case of uncorrectable errors, where both of these charge bits flip to the discharge state. Now, after ECC decoding, there are several possible post-correction data patterns that we might observe. And here we show the potential effects of four different parity check matrices labeled HA through HD. And we see that in each of these, there's an H-dependent operation that occurs. And for HA, this H-dependent operation results in an error syndrome that points to the discharge data in the uh, uncorrectable error pattern. And so the ECC logic goes ahead and corrects that, and we observe no error at all. In the other cases with the three different parity check matrices B, C, and D, the error syndrome points to one of the already correct bits. And so this actually exacerbates the number of errors, and we observe a two-bit error. Um, in the post-correction data, even though there's only one error within the actual data in the code word. 
And so what's important to note here is that the different H matrices generate different error syndromes. And this means that we can differentiate the error syndromes based on their uncorrectable error patterns. And this allows us to overcome this challenge of somehow inferring error syndromes, even though we can't directly measure them. OK, so now what remains is to put this together into a methodology that would actually work. And so what we need to do is choose a set of test patterns to use to apply these techniques that we've talked about. And so in our work, we consider what we call the n-charge test patterns, that each set n bits to the charge state. For example, in the one charge patterns, we have a single bit set to the charge state, and all other cells are in the discharge state. Now, our paper explains that the combined one and two charge patterns are actually sufficient in order to identify the ECC function. And in order to do this, for each of the test patterns that we test, we need to find all possible uncorrectable errors that occur. And so, for example, if I go back to the previous slide, um, we see here that with these two charged cells, there are four possible error patterns that can occur, right? And so we want to observe all of these. And so what we need to do is for each test pattern, go ahead and do this. And this is very reasonable to do actually, because we can exploit the uniform randomness of data retention errors. And this is because even a single DRAM chip provides us with millions of samples of these errors to look at. For example, a two gigabyte DRAM module yields two to the 24, 128 bit ECC words that we can test. And across all of these different ECC words, because errors occur uniform randomly, we're very likely to observe all the different error patterns that can occur for a given test pattern. Um, yeah, so I see a question in the chat. Um, could I explain what the error syndrome means? So I'm going to go back to the slide where um, I was trying to explain this. So let's see. So on this slide here, this is where I'm trying to represent the error syndrome. So the error syndrome is this quantity here, S, which, the, which is computed using the parity check matrix and the code word that potentially has errors. And the point of the error syndrome is to identify exactly where the error is, right? So internally, this is how the ECC logic decides whether an error occurred or not. It computes the error syndrome and the value of the error syndrome is essentially one of these bit positions, right? So if you want to think about this as like an index, you can even do that because by constructing the parity check matrix in a certain way, we can ensure that this error syndrome here, S, is directly an index into the code word pointing to the error that it thinks exists. So for example, if the S evaluates to zero, then actually, so zero means that there's no error. But if it evaluates to a one, it points to the first bit, two, the second bit, three, the third bit, all the way up to a value of seven, which would point to the seventh bit, right? And so you know, it can get more complicated if you use a fancier parity check matrix. But in essence, the point of the error syndrome is just to, it, it's the part that figures out where the error is. And so in the case of correctable errors, it, you know, it always points to the correctable error. But in the case of uncorrectable errors, it will point to a different place that doesn't necessarily indicate the error. OK. OK, fantastic. So yeah, if there's any other questions, just you know, post them in the chat, and I'm, I'm happy to try and address them as best as I can. OK, so I'll, um, I'll go back to where we were here. So yes, so in, in this slide, essentially, we, um, we, yeah, so we want to see all of the different error patterns that can occur, because we want to see all of the different error syndromes that the ECC logic might compute. Right? OK. So the next step is to put all of this together into the actual methodology that we call BEER. And so here, we end up with BEER, which is a three-step testing methodology. The first step is to experimentally induce data retention errors using the combined one and two charge test patterns. Right? The second step is that for each test pattern that we use, we want to identify all possible uncorrectable errors that might occur. And although we don't know exactly which uncorrectable errors happen within the DRAM chip, we can observe their effects based on the post-correction error patterns, right? which mean that different error syndromes are generated. And third, we solve for the ECC function that provides the observed behavior of step two by using a SAT solver. And so I'm not going to talk about SAT solvers in too much detail, but you can essentially think of them as Boolean equation solvers. And so essentially, we can encode all of these test patterns and everything as Boolean equations and ask the SAT solver to answer the question, you know, which which parity check matrix can possibly generate the observed observations, right? And so the SAT solver will give us the results, whether something is possible or not. Um, that depends on how, the fidelity of the data and whether you use the right test patterns. And I'll talk about it more when we you know, discuss SAT solvers later in this talk. OK, so the next step is to evaluate beer in experiments and simulation. And so I'm going to briefly cover our experimental methodology and some of our results, just so you get an idea of how this process works. So the experimental methodology involves using 80 LPDDR4 DRAM chips from three major DRAM manufacturers, whom we anonymize as A, B, and C, uh, just for confidentiality reasons. Um, all of our testing is done in a temperature control testing infrastructure, 
And we do that in order to control the data retention errors that occur. And this testing infrastructure provides us with control over the DRAM timings, including those of DRAM refresh, which is important for inducing data retention errors. So in order to induce data retention errors, we test refresh windows between one and 30 minutes at temperatures of between 30 and 80 degrees centigrade. Now, considering that the default refresh interval is 32 to 64 milliseconds, waiting one to 30 minutes is much longer and allows many, many data retention errors to occur. And in our experiments, this leads to bit error rates of between 10 to the minus seven and 10 to the minus three. Now, uh, you know, a, a commodity DRAM chip in the market that it doesn't experience errors typically has a bit error rate of between, you know, 10 to the minus 15 and 10 to the minus 17. And so these error rates are orders of magnitude higher than that. And so you can think of these as rampantly occurring all throughout the DRAM chip. And so we have lots and lots of uncorrectable errors. And essentially these, um, as an added bonus, essentially, these bit error rates are far larger than those of unwanted soft errors that might interfere with their experiments. So for example, those of you who might be familiar with, you know, particle strike effects and things like that causing random bit flips, um, those really aren't a big deal because the error rates we're inducing are far higher than these soft error events that we don't want in our experiments. Okay, so let's take a look at applying beer to these LPDDR4 DRAM chips. And so in this experiment I'm about to present, we're studying the uncorrectable errors that occur using the one charge test patterns. So here I show three images, each one coming from chips of a different manufacturer, right? So there's manufacturers A, B, and C. And so the x-axis within each of these figures shows the bit index within this 128-bit ECC data word, right? Because this is a 128-bit error correcting code. Um, and so on the, on the y-axis here, we're showing the different one charge test patterns. And so because we have a 128 data bits, there are 128 different charge test patterns that we can apply, right? And so these are enumerated from zero through 127, where for example, test pattern zero sets bit zero to the charge state. So the first, th uh, uh, sorry, excuse me. So the purple here represents that errors are not observed in those bit positions. And the colors moving all the way up to yellow show that many errors are occurring here. And this data is aggregated across a whole bunch of ECC words inside the DRAM chip. So we're actually observe, observing the aggregate effects of lots of different uncorrectable error patterns. So the first thing that we want to, I want to point out here is the errors along the y equals x line in each of these figures. And these are expected because these are the data retention errors that are occurring within the one charge bits themselves. So this is a good sanity check of our test, just you know, letting us know that the uncorrectable errors are working as expected. In the other off y equals x axis bit positions, um, these are called miscorrections. And these are the uncorrectable errors that occur because the error syndrome that's computed by ECC points to that particular bit position. Now, because the underlying data bit in that position is uncharged, we cannot have an, un, um, excuse me, we cannot have a data retention error in those positions. And so anything we observe there must be a result of the ECC correction. And essentially this is how we're inferring error syndromes, right? So what we notice by looking at all three of these different plots is that they look very different. And so essentially there's a high variation between these different manufacturers. And this indicates that the different manufacturers are actually using different parity check matrices. Essentially they're using different ECC functions. And looking closely at the, these um, error profiles of manufacturers B and C, we see repeating patterns within their designs. And this indicates that there's some sort of underlying structure within the parity check matrix. For example, it's, you know, it's not just random entries, it's maybe more of a textbook style design or the entries are sort of in ascending order or, or something like this. You know? It's, it's not a completely randomly generated parity check matrix. Now our takeaway from this analysis is that first, different manufacturers appear to use different on ECC functions, which is not obvious by just looking at the device. Um, for example, it's not listed in the data sheets and the manufacturers don't expose this information. And our second takeaway from this analysis is that chips of the same model number appear to use identical ECC functions. Now, this is because when we repeat this analysis for multiple different DRAM chips from the same model number, we get the exact same error profiles out. And I don't show that in this slide, but it, we, we know we talk about this in our paper. So now that we have these error profiles, we can go ahead and solve for the ECC function. And in our work, we use the Z3SAT solver um, to identify the parity check matrix. And although we demonstrate beer in this work for these single error correcting Hamming codes that I've been talking about, it should readily extend to all linear block codes, which is a category of ECC codes. And for example, some of you might've heard of you know, BCH codes or Reed Solomon codes. Um, these are all linear block codes that we're dealing with. So um, again here, I'm not gonna talk about the SAT solver too much more, but essentially given the observations of the previous slide, which I'm gonna back up. Yeah, so these errors that we observe here, we can feed these into the SAT solver along with the properties of an error correcting code 
and ask the SAT solver to give us an H matrix that can satisfy those constraints, right? And so in this case, the constraints are essentially the observations that we have in this plot, right? So which H matrix can result in these observations? And the SAT solver will provide us with the result. So in our work, we open source our beer implementation on GitHub. And so it's at this link shown on the slide and you can take a look at our implementation and see how you know, we apply these constraints to the SAT solver and actually get the final H matrix. And um, we can you, you can even apply this methodology yourself for simulated data. So unfortunately, we face two limitations to validation in our work. First, we have no way to check the final results because we cannot see into the on ECC implementation, right? The ground truth essentially is invisible to us because in order to get at it, we'd have to somehow tear open the chip and in inspect the circuitry manually or something like this. And, and we really don't have the capability to do this right now. Second, we're actually not able to share our final H matrices um, because of confidentiality reasons with the manufacturers. And so essentially this refers to the H matrices that we solve for using the SAT solver, right? So we can show simulated results, but not experimental results. And so in order to overcome these limitations to validation, we evaluate beer in simulation. And this allows us to evaluate correctness because we do know the ground truth in simulation to overcome our confidentiality issues because we can present these results. And finally, to test a much larger set of ECC codes than we could in an experiment, right? So instead of just showing these three different 128-bit ECC codes, we can test in a large variety of them in simulation. And so now I'm gonna talk about our simulation methodology a little bit. So we use the EinSim DRAM error correction simulator, which is actually, it follows up from some of our previous work and allows us to simulate data retention errors and different ECC functions. And so we go ahead and simulate over 100,000 different single error correcting Hamming codes. And um, here we can simulate ECC data words of varying lengths, you know, ranging from four to 247 bits in our analysis. Now the, the real chips that we use have 128 bits, right? So it falls somewhere in the middle of that regime. And so in order to demonstrate our simulation results, we show the one, two, three, and the one and two charge test patterns, even though you know, we say that the combined one and two charge test patterns are sufficient. And for each test pattern that we use, we induce errors in a similar way to our experimental analysis. And so we use a similar number of words as you might have in a real DRAM chip and the data retention error rates we use are comparable to those that we see in our actual experiments. Okay, so first I'm gonna talk about our correctness evaluation. And so here in this experiment that I'm gonna show, we're evaluating the number of SAT solutions found by beer. And this is because the SAT solver can go ahead and find multiple solutions if the constraints aren't tight enough. Right? So for example, with just the one charge test patterns, which we argue are not sufficient, the SAT solver might not be able to identify the single unique function that's actually used in the DRAM chip. And so this analysis essentially shows us whether the unique solution is identified. And so this plot here summarizes our results. So on the x-axis here, we're showing ECC codes of different data word lengths. So keep in mind that you know, our real devices use 128-bit uh, data words, um, but we simulate a wide range of these just to show the analysis. And on the x on the, excuse me, on the y-axis, we're showing the number of unique ECC functions found. And so each data point here actually shows a distribution of all the ECC codes that we simulate, right? And so the first thing I want to point out is that the one and two charge patterns combined, which here are shown in red, succeed for all test cases. And this is because for each of these points and all the different ECC codes we simulate, um, our analysis identifies exactly one ECC function responsible for this. And that one function corresponds to the ground truth that we used in the simulation. On the other hand, the one, two, and three charge patterns individually do not always succeed. And we can see this because sometimes they find multiple ECC functions that can explain the, obs uh, explain the observed data. And this essentially means that their constraints are not tight enough to uniquely identify the function. And so our takeaway from this analysis is that Beer successfully identifies the ECC function using the combined one and two charge test patterns. Now, in our paper, we have two other evaluations of Beer. The first is the practicality of Beer's SAT problem. Now, in a common problem with SAT solvers is that even though you can specify the problem in terms of all of these SAT constraints, it can actually be really difficult to evaluate because a SAT solver might need to perform some sort of brute force analysis of the entire solution space. And so in order to demonstrate that this is realistic in the context of our work, we measure the SAT problem's runtime and memory consumption. And we find that for short codes, you know, something shorter than 32 data bits, uh, the runtime and memory consumption are negligible. And for longer codes, um, the runtime and memory consumption are relatively high. So beer takes approximately 60 hours to evaluate the SAT constraint for 128-bit code. Um, but this is actually realistic, given that beer is a one-time offline process. And once you've identified the ECC function, there's no need to repeat the exercise for that particular chip. The second evaluation that we do is an analytical experimental runtime analysis. And the majority of our time in our experiments, we find, is spent waiting for data retention errors to occur. 
And this amounts to approximately 4.2 hours of testing per chip in the experiments that we present in our paper. Now, again, this is not really that big a deal because this is a one-time process, but we can actually make this even faster by parallelizing across different chips because the different chips, you know, as we showed, um, actually use the same ECC function. And so the same data that we expect from one chip is, you know, the, this, we expect the same data from multiple chips essentially. Okay, so yeah, but you can refer to our paper if you're more interested in these analysis and the results are presented there. So finally, I'm gonna talk about BEEP and other practical use cases for beer that we present in our paper. And so in our paper, we talk about five use cases that demonstrate how knowing the ECC function can be useful in practice. The first is error profiling. And here we introduce BEEP to actually show how knowing the ECC function enables us to identify the raw bit error locations that correspond to the observed post-correction errors. The second use case deals with system design. And we discuss how architecting DRAM controller error mitigation mechanisms that are informed about on DAG ECC is actually a much better process than blindly trying to support arbitrary ECC functions. Our third and fourth use cases deal with testing, where we show that knowing the ECC function enables us to craft worst case test patterns that enable ineff efficiently testing and validating actual test patterns within the DRAM chip and to better perform root cause analyses to explain observed uncorrectable errors. And our final use case deals with error characterization, where we show that knowing the ECC function enables us to better study the statistical properties of raw bit errors. For example, their spatial distributions within the DRAM chip. So in, if for in the interest of time, I'm gonna focus on just this first use case, BEEP. And um, so yeah, let's, let's talk about BEEP in a little more detail. So BEEP deals with profiling for raw bit errors. And the key idea that BEEP exploits is that knowing the ECC function, for instance, via using beer, uh, enables us to calculate the raw bit error positions. So here, for example, let's suppose that we have a raw error pattern, which is before ECC correction of you know, these four errors within the code word. Now the ECC decoder, um, essentially represents the transformation that the parity check matrix uh, defines. And we observe some say, for in, excuse me, in this example, these two bit errors um, in the middle of the data word. So now because we know exactly what the parity check matrix is, we know what's happening in the ECC decoder. And we can go ahead and calculate what the raw error pattern is given the observed uncorrectable errors. And the way by which we do this is a little more involved. And so it's explained in more detail in the paper. But essentially given this process, Beep is able to infer which physical cells are susceptible to data retention errors just by looking at the observed post-correction errors. And so putting this together into a high-level algorithm, Beeps looks something like this. So Beep essentially iteratively tests each bit in the ECC code word and keeps track of the different error-prone cells that it identifies as it goes along. So for instance, for each bit in the ECC word, Beep first crafts a test pattern that targets the particular bit that we're interested in testing, right? And we can do this knowing the ECC function. Second, BEEP tests for data retention errors, and so essentially looks for any uncorrectable errors that occur with these test patterns. And third, it calculates the raw bit error locations that correspond to any uncorrectable errors that are observed. And using these raw bit error locations, it updates the list of known errors and essentially repeats this for each bit in the ECC code word. And therefore, by iterating throughout the entire code word, BEEP is able to figure out which uncorrectable errors exist. So now I'll quickly talk about evaluating BEEP's accuracy. And we, in our, in our paper, we evaluate Beep's success rate of identifying raw bit errors in simulation. And the success rate here means how often Beep is able to actually identify all of the uncorrectable errors, excuse me, all of the pre-correction errors within the code word. And so we do this for varying ECC word lengths and bit error rates. And for each measurement that we take, we simulate 100 ECC words and essentially see how often out of those 100 words Beep is successful. And so here, I'm gonna flash this plot. Um, it's a little bit busy, I understand. Um, so I'll try and break it down a little bit just so we can understand what's happening. So on the x-axis, we're showing the number of errors that we inject within a given code word. And so for each of these different groups on the x-axis, two, three, four, uh, so forth, we're injecting you know, two, three, four, and so forth errors within the code word. On the y-axis, we show Beep's success rate. And so out of these 100 ECC words that we simulate, how often does Beep succeed? Now, each of these different groups on the x-axis are divided into three sets of bars, right? And these, are, these correspond to the three different colors that correspond to 31-bit code words, 63-bit code words, and 127-bit code words. And within each of these individual code word groups, um, we show different error rates. And the error rates correspond to the probability of each of the pre-correction errors occurring, right? So for example, if we're testing a probability of error of one, then the data retention errors in the underlying error, uh, the erroneous bits occur every single time, you know, probability of 100, um, probability of one. Um, whereas a probability of 0.25, these data retention errors manifest only a quarter of the time. And so what we see in this plot is that Beep is rather successful in cases of longer ECC words and higher probability errors, 
And both of these are relatively intuitive because higher probability error, excuse me, higher probability errors are simply easier to detect, right? Because the more test patterns that you use, um, the more likely you're able to see those errors. And for longer ECC words, there are simply more test patterns that we use. And having fewer bits in a longer code word allows us to discover them more easily. And so our takeaway here is that beep is more successful for longer ECC words and higher probability errors. Now, there's a lot of other information in the paper that I simply don't have time to cover in today's talk. And this includes formalism for beer and the N-charge test patterns. More evaluations for beer in both experiment and simulation, including sensitivity to experimental noise, an analysis of experimental runtime, and the practicality of the SAT problem that I mentioned earlier. Um, we evaluate beep in simulation even more, and we show its accuracy at different error rates and its sensitivity to different ECC codes and word sizes. We provide a detailed discussion of use cases for beer, and we provide a discussion on beer's requirements and limitations in practice. And so um, I quickly want to conclude with a summary of my talk, right? And so the problem that this work tackles is that DRAM on DICC complicates third-party reliability studies. And in order to overcome this problem, our goal is to understand exactly how on DICC is obfuscating errors. And to achieve this, we introduced two methodologies, BEER and BEEP. And BEER is a new testing methodology that allows us to determine the DRAM chip's unique on DICC function. In other words, it's parity check matrix. And BEEP allows us to um, infer the raw bit errors that correspond to observed uncorrectable errors. So we evaluate both BEER and BEEP in simulation and BEER also in experiment. And we open source our implementation shown at the link shown on the slide. And finally, you know, we hope that both BEER and BEEP enable many valuable studies going forward. And so this, you know, this concludes my talk. So I'm gonna leave it on this slide just to, you know, just as an overview. So if you guys have any questions, I'm happy to try and answer them now. Great, yeah, so while we're waiting for questions, I think um, as Professor Mutlu said at the beginning, I can talk a little bit about what we envision um, as the next steps for this work, right? So this work enables us to look at what's going on within the DRAM chip, right? So prior to this work, we didn't really have a concrete technique for understanding exactly what's happening with the pre-correction error characteristics. But with the tools that this work provides, we hope that this is actually possible now. And so this enables us to go in two different directions that we see. The, the first is, essentially studying these pre-correction characteristics in modern DRAM chips, right? So as we've been talking about in lecture, um, DRAM faces a, a lot of reliability issues as we keep scaling this technology down. And in order to understand those issues, we need to know what's going on in the DRAM chip. And so just by looking at the post-correction error characteristics, we can't do that very effectively because it's sort of masking what's actually happening within the DRAM technology itself. And so with our work, we're hoping that, you know, we can compare these devices as to what's actually happening in the DRAM technology before and after the implementation of Lambda ECC and what might happen going forward with stronger error correction codes. And the second direction that I see is um, sort of thinking of better solutions, actually. So Lambda ECC is nice for now, but it's not necessarily a sustainable solution, right? Because error rates will continue to become worse and worse. And this single error correcting code that we saw here will need to become stronger and stronger. And at some point it'll impact latency, power, um, chip area, all of these more and more. Right? And so at some point, on ECC won't be the best possible solution. And so we see this work as a way for system architects and you know, overall system designers to participate more in the DRAM design process and maybe come to a complementary solution that allows both sides of this issue to sort of tackle the problem together. Because one, on ECC is a very one-sided solution, right? It's exclusively within the DRAM chip. Um, and we hope that you know, this sort of work allows these two parties to collaborate better and even for researchers to propose better solutions that are aware of what's actually happening. Um, so yeah, I see, I see some questions in the Zoom chat, so I'll go ahead and try and address them. So the first question is, do you know for sure if bit one corresponds to the charge state in all of the DRAM chips? So that's, a, that's an excellent question. And actually, um, we, it, it doesn't work that way. So bit one doesn't always correspond to the um, charge state, but we're actually able to figure this out by using some testing approaches. So for example, if we program the entire DRAM chip with all ones and you know, one does correspond to the charge state, then we would expect many of these bits to fail. Regardless of whether ECC is trying to you know, correct one of the bits or the other, if we assume that the data that we write is actually the data that's stored, so that systematic encoding that I talked about earlier, um, we can figure out that whether a one corresponds to the charge state or a zero corresponds to the charge state. And in our paper, we actually show this analysis for um, the ECC 
the EC, excuse me, the DRAM chips that we test. And we find that, you know, in two of the manufacturers, um, one actually does represent to the char does represent the charge state and zero the discharge state. And the other manufacturer, um, manufacturer C, uses a mix of these two, where half of the cells use one as the charge state and the other half use zero. And it's organized in a very nice pattern that you know um, we can go ahead and just make use of. Um, and so the second question I see on the chat is, uh, can you maybe explain once again how Beep calculates raw bit error locations? Yeah. So I'm going to go back to that slide where I, I sort of glossed over this a bit because. Um, the paper explains this in more detail with a little bit of formalism. It's hard to kind of get it across with just the slide. But here on this slide, essentially I'm saying that by knowing what the ECC decoder is doing, we can go ahead and calculate what the underlying errors are for a particular uncorrectable error pattern that we see. And this is because we actually see both sides of this, right? So here I'm just showing the observed uncorrectable errors. But the thing is, we also know what we started out with. So actually, let me go to, um, let me go to a different slide real quick, I think. Um, earlier where I introduced this, uh, yes, right here. So here, um, I think this, what, what, we, what happens when we observe uncorrectable errors is that we know exactly what happens with the data word prime, right? Because this is the uncorrectable error pattern that we observe, but we also know what data word we wrote, right? And as a result of beer, we actually know what's going on both of these G and H matrices um, because they're very intimately connected to each other. And by figuring out the parity check matrix, we also figure out the generator matrix. And so we actually know the transformation steps of going here, going here, and going here. And so the only part we don't know is actually which errors occurred within code word to code word prime. And so we can set this up as a simple like system of linear equations, right? And um, with the system of equations, we have one equation for each of the different bits in the code word prime. And by solving that system, we essentially solve for each of these actual bits here. Um, yeah, so I know that's a high level explanation. And, I hope it makes sense at the high level, but you know you can look at our paper and I try to provide an example there just so you, you know what's going on. Um, yeah, absolutely, you're very welcome. Okay, so hey, I think, I think, yeah. Oh, yeah. I guess sorry. there are no more questions. So thank, thanks a lot, Minesh, for the uh, nice lecture. And if, there, if students have questions, they can put it on Piazza or email you directly. But uh, uh, I agree with Manish that this is a very fertile area of research and there may be many more ideas uh, that may come up. And those two directions that you mentioned are actually quite uh, interesting for sure uh, to examine. Okay, cool. Thanks, Manish. Sure.